Um, thank you very much, um, Rachel and Takaz, um, to for inviting us to speak this evening about um, a project really that's been happening since about 2019. Um, so the project itself found inspiration in October 2019, to be specific, with the discovery of a lead ingot or lead pig, as we tend to refer to it, in Wrexham County Borough. Um, and so far has led to the discovery of North East Wales's first identified Roman villa. So this evening, uh, Steve and myself would like to take you through the different stages of the project and its implications for understanding Roman activity in this part of the world. So to start us off though, um, just to sort of a bit of a chronological and archeological background to the area. Uh, the obvious bit, which I hope all of you are aware of, is of course uh, the invasion of the Roman army of Britain um, under the, uh, uh, the guidance of the emperor Claudius in AD 43. And it's not really until AD 48, so a few years later, um, that we have records of the army coming up to this part of the world under Astoria's scapula campaigning against the Decciangli. And then our kind of um, story for, for the, the archaeology that we're looking at doesn't really start until AD 63 to 69 under the governorship of Marcus Trebellius Maximus, who we understand um, from Tacitus was brought in to um, sort of calm the province or to rule the province after the aftermath of the Boudican Rebellion. So we're looking at a period just before um, the fortress at Chester is founded by the Second Legion um, and some 20 odd years before the permanent garrison of Diva um, take over in, in the 80s. So the known area um, pertaining to sort of the Roman period uh, consists very much of military sites. Um, these are the ones that have very much been identified, as you can see in Burnham and Davis's um, image on the right hand side of the forts and military sites known around AD 80. Although some practice camps continue to be added to our current state of knowledge, um, as people like Toby Driver of the Royal Commission continue to sort of fly um, over Wales. So we're part of Britannia's western frontier in northeast Wales. But we're also connected by a Chester um, up through Cheshire, Lancashire, um, up to the northern frontier in Cumbria. Beyond the military installations, um, the majority of known Roman sites in northeast Wales largely relate to mineral extraction, as you can see on the left hand image, and industrial processing. So, for example, perhaps the best known sites um, for Halkin, uh, but also where, where the minerals are being extracted, but also the large scale uh, processing sites of Flint and Oakenholt. We've also got potential mining at Minera um, lightly linked to things like the industrial activity found at Freeth. So most of the known settlement we've got directly sort of links to the military at Chester in some way. Even at Plas Cork, and I'm sure Steve knows a lot more about this than I do, uh, just off the A483 down towards Wrexham, there appears to be more going on um, than a sort of a, a simple rural site that's primarily focused on agricultural production. Elsewhere in Cheshire, um, the only other known villa is at Eaton by Tarpley. I think I saw David Mason's name um, in the audience, so he'll know more about that one. Um, there could be a possible villa at Satan Camp, just south of Chester, but once again, the, the buildings haven't yet been attested or, or identified. Um, and the Roman material culture um, just over at Poulton also hints at very interesting but not fully understood Roman settlement that there sits chronologically and stratigraphically between the hugely interesting Iron Age settlement and the medieval chapel. Otherwise, we only tend to have small sort of snippets of evidence for activity across North East Wales. The Roman roads are fairly well known in and out of Diva, out of Chester itself with some routes across the coastal plateau being archaeologically quite well attested. Yet some lines of roads heading south from Chester, especially from Heronbridge to Freeth and onwards to Bala and Brithbeer, are mostly postulated. There are also likely more kind of minor routeways and trackways across the landscape that currently lie sort of hidden beneath our feet. So I suppose the other thing to note um, is that no Roman towns are known from North Wales, um, the nearest uh, perhaps being the Cuvitas capital at Roxeter, 
therefore, it's always been assumed that the majority of the population was living in the Viki or civilian settlements associated with the military forts in mid and north Wales, or perhaps in archaeologically quite ephemeral farmsteads or roundhouse settlements. So known rural settlement is therefore quite few and far between. Um, the Roman Rural Settlement Project of Britain, um, conducted by the University of Reading and Cotswold Archaeology, has identified a handful of rural settlements, although there are some issues with what they categorise as a rural settlement. Um, they're not necessarily what we've got in North, North East Wales is not necessarily the, the regular rural farmsteads that we would expect. And as I mentioned, they tend to have these sort of industrial or military connections. However, the number of Roman finds and snippets of Roman material from northeast Wales hint at higher levels of activity than the number of known settlements would suggest. And so you've got the PAS or find spots for Wales on, on the left image with the known kind of excavated Roman settlements, um, rural settlements on the right. And actually, if we drill down into that a bit, um, and look at Wrexham County Borough itself, the number and distribution of Roman finds recorded on the PAS database potentially indicates a much higher level of intensity of Roman activity than it again is reflected in the number of sites that we already know about. So before this project started, sort of a broad summary of the current state of knowledge was that the majority of sites in North East Wales are associated with industry and exploitation of mineral resources, especially to do with the lead and silver production. We've got brooch production at Prestatin, pottery and tile, so tile works obviously at Holt, and perhaps pottery production perhaps at Plas Corch. Most sites seem to date to the Flavian period and later. Um, a lot of them have military connections with the 20th based in Chester. A lot of them also seem to be abandoned quite early, so especially the industrial sites, um, they seem to have the, the sort of the height of their at the time of, of campaigning and shortly after, so suggesting the Roman state needs those materials um, to sort of keep functioning. The very few non-military sites have been identified to date, no known villas in northeast Wales, um, yet the spot finds tend to hint at a bit more. So to start off um, our project, I'd like to just hand you over to Steve um, to say a bit of the origins of what we've been doing. So good evening, everyone. So our Rex Museum's interest in the Roman period in this area of the county borough actually goes back a, a fair uh, time. And it almost reflects, I suppose, the growth of treasure hunting as a modern hobby and the, the, the start of reporting of um, particularly copper alloy material from the, the, this area of the north of the north of the town. Uh, we first started hearing about large, large-ish amounts of particularly bronze brooches coming up to the east of Rosset, being found by being found by a particular individual who was a, a leading member of one of the local tre treasure hunting clubs. And then sometime, and I can't remember the exact year, but sometime in the early noughties, um, a local treasure hunter took some material he'd found in a field to the west of Rosset to one of the local detector club meetings in, in, in Wrexham. You know, they have a sort of find of the month um, idea going on in many of these sort of meetings. And he brought along, from what I can remember, a silver denarius of the Emperor Hadrian and a couple of brooches from the site. Now he was fairly reticent to tell, I, I just happened to have a member of staff at that meeting, and she her ears immediately pricked up when this guy brought this material forward as what he'd found in the area. So she had a conversation with him. He was fairly reticent to tell us where exactly this material was coming from, but eventually after some months or even a couple of years, we were able to narrow it down to a particular field off uh, Stringer's Lane to the, again, to the to the west of, of Rosset. Um, we then went through, a, I mean, that's in a sense is not hugely unusual, as I say, and as Caroline has shown from the, PA, the, the present PAS data, there is a sprinkling of Roman material across the whole of the county borough. Um, and there was, there was nothing in this particular assemblage that, that sparked a so much of an interest that we would immediately jump in the car and race to the site. Um, but it still stuck in our minds that there was something interesting potentially going on there. Eventually, uh, we were able to discover where the field was that this material was coming from. 
So one fine summer's afternoon, I decided to have a wander over there. Um, couldn't find out who the owner of the field was, but luckily there was a public footpath that ran adjacent to the site. Um, so I had a, had a wander, I looked over the field, uh, particularly wandered with, in my wellies down the brook that uh, marks the southern boundary of the field and found about a third of a, a Roman rotary quirk stone, obviously used for, for grinding uh, grain into, into flour, but also uh, uh, some fragments of some flute, Roman flue tiles. Now that elevated our interest in the site to some extent because particularly Roman flue tiles are, are suggestive of potentially underfloor heating systems, hypercore systems, and therefore was suggestive of the fact that the site was reasonably high status. And, and at the time I remember thinking possibly Villa, possibly Mancio or something in that sort of, in that sort of order. So we, so we, we doubled down on our attempts to find out who owned the field. I remember writing letters to local farmers, all of which have the same surname, interestingly, um, trying to discover who owned this particular field, um, never got a response to the letters, um, spoke to our local councillor, who, who uh, is also the lead member for the heritage services within, within the council, just happens to be the lead member for Rosset, and he, he, he was trying to help us as well to find out who owned this particular field. Um, but it, this all came to a head, and, and as Karen already mentioned, the, the lead ingot. So the, the image on the left of the slide, you can see a rather pleased chap in um, army camouflage gear. Uh, that's Rob Jones. He's the local detectorist who was detecting in this field off Cobbler's Lane, just to the north uh, northwest of Rosset. When he was about to, as all these stories seem to go, he was about to give up for the day, having found nothing at all in this very large field, when he suddenly got a contact on his detector. Um, so he started exploring what he was finding. And Rob, being a very responsible detectorist, um, took a photograph of what he'd found and sent it to uh, our portable antiquities officer, who works for the National Museum of Wales, but is actually based at Rex Museum. Um, now, I was out of the office at the time, I was in a meeting somewhere out of county, and I got back to the museum at um, some point during the day, switched on my email account just to check whether I had any emails to see this photograph of this object sitting in a hole. Um, I, I thought I knew immediately what it was, and it was one of those moments when you jump in the car and head there straight away. So um, I, I got uh, Susie, I took Susie, which is the lady in blue there, who's, who's kneeling, who's looking down at the object we've, we've, uh, we've brought out of the hole. Also got Ian Grant from the Clue House Archaeological Trust in Bold as well. And we all headed to the field and we were there within about 20 minutes of seeing the, uh, the photograph. And you can see me at the bottom of the, the slide there um, with the object in my hands, pulling it out of the ground. Uh, it was a hot, warm day, uh, but as you can see, I'm rather straining and I'm straining because the thing weighs 63.2 kilos. So it's not the lightest object in the world. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Carmen. There we go. So as you, as you can see, it's quite an interesting object. Um, it is, as you say, a lead ingot. It's about 450 millimetres long. It's about perhaps 100, 120 millimetres high. It's got a very interesting inscription on the top surface. Uh, it's heavily abbreviated or ligatured. Um, it's a very, even on the day when it, we found it, um, we weren't, it was clear that it was quite an interesting and very different inscription to the ones we've, we've seen in the past. Obviously the Grover Museum have got a number of them that have come originally probably from Holkin Mountain and are on display in the museum there. But this, the, just the nature of this inscription was very, very different. Um, the, the ingot itself, has had some seen some damage since it's been in the ground. Um, some of them, I think, are probably plough scars. Others, I think, probably are not, and maybe probably relate to some sort of Roman um, interference with the object. But particularly on the, lo the lower left corner of the pig, there seems to have been a, a, a decided, definite attempt to take off one corner of the. Oh, thanks for pointing, kind of taking one off one corner of the of the pig. And it's interestingly, it's removed, we think it's removed the, the emperor's name, Nero. And it has been suggested that it may be an example of the, of the um, removal of the emperor's name after he was um, 
announced to be an, an enemy of the public in 60, was it 68 or 69 AD? Um, Damnatio Memoria, I think it's called. Um, the inscription itself is, is significant for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, the, the interpretation of the inscription is somewhat subjective. There is some damage to the inscription here and there. So therefore, the, um, there are some areas which are open to interpretation. But the consensus seems to be, and nobody has seriously challenged it since we've pub it's been published, it mentions the name of the mine where the pig has come from. This is in the roughly in the center of the inscription. It mentions a place called Magul or Magulum or Magulium. Um, that is a place then that doesn't survive to us today, so we don't know uh, where that is, although we have some suspicions. But perhaps even more interesting, towards the right-hand side of the pig, it mentions our friend Marcus Trebellius Maximus, governor of the province of Britannia between 63 and 69. AD, and it's the only known inscription that bears his name ever to be found in the UK. So it's quite an important object uh, in terms of the history of the, of the, the province of Britannia. Um, it's so interesting that uh, the, the pig has been on its holidays in London for the last few months. Uh, it's been uh, down at the British Museum uh, on display as part of the Nero exhibition there, but it's coming, the good news is it's coming back to Wrexham on Monday and uh, we'll be going into the Hidden Holt exhibition, which we'll say a, bit, a little bit about towards the end of the, of the talk. Now, we were very keen to acquire the object as, uh, on behalf of the museum uh, because it's made of lead. Currently, it's not covered by treasure legislation. So therefore, we were able to negotiate with the landowner for its purchase. We valued it. We raised the money from various sources, including the DNA Acquisition Fund and Friends of Rex Museum contributed as well. And we were eventually able to purchase the, the pig for our, our permanent uh, collections. Next slide, please. So we've had some analysis done care of Liverpool University. Um, it's been very helpful to us in terms of this sort of scientific analysis of the pig. The pig itself is in is that, thank you, is that big blue square in the middle of the red circle. Um, and although, again, there's a certain amount of subjectivity and interpretation as part of this evidence, and, and don't expect me to explain the science of it, because I'm an archaeologist, not a, um, a geologist, but the, the, it seems to me that it sits quite nicely in the sort of flincher or um, areas, those sort of slightly larger blue circles. There are a, little, a lot of quite orange triangles in that area, which are the Cumbrian lead pigs. But a lot of those, if not most, if not all of those, are associated with the Adrian's Wall construction in the from the one twenties onwards. Very surprising if a, a lead pig appeared in Cumbria at the time of this of this between sixty two and sixty so sixty three and sixty nine A.D. So I think we're reasonably confident uh, that the and the geologists are reasonably confident that the the lead that the pig is uh, made out of has come from a flincher. Uh, source. Now, because the nature of the pig is very different to the ones that we've seen from Hulkin Mountain, the process down at Oakenholt and Flint, um, it seems, and, and of course it's somewhat earlier, so all those pigs that we know of to date, and obviously more, I dare say more will be found as the years roll by, all seem to date from the time of the Emperor Vespasian and later, um, whereas this obviously is, is late Julie Claudian. Um, so my guess would be uh, is that this pig has come from possibly somewhere like Freeth, where there is some evidence of lead processing in the earliest phase, or even possibly Minera. But the, um, the, the issues around Minera is obviously there was extensive medieval to 19th century lead working there, which has probably largely destroyed anything that was, pre was, was prior to that in terms of the Roman period. Oh, there is some suggestion of some Roman fire setting activity in some areas of, that, of, of Monera. So it wouldn't be astonishing to find uh, that the lead has come from, from that sort of area of, of southern, very southern Flintshire or eastern Rex County Borough. Uh, and that's my story, and I'm going to stick to it until somebody tells it proves otherwise. But it was the discovery of this of this of this pig and the our interest in it. We were clearly very keen to see whether there's any archaeological context to the pig. Uh, as I said, the pig weighs a weighs a fair ton. Sixty three kilos is a lot of is a lot of weight. Um, 
So we just happened to have a an incidental conversation with myself and Caroline about how, how interesting it was this pig had turned up in this part of the county borough and its date in terms of in terms of the 60s AD. So we applied for a grant from the Roman Research Trust to carry out some explorations uh, of the field where the pig had been found to see whether there was any evidence for an archaeological context in that field, particularly in my in my case interested in that Roman, possibly that Roman road that goes from Chester down towards Freeth and then on to Bala and Brithdeer. So we had a grant to do some geophysical surveys, thanks to Chris Matthews at Archaeology Surveys West. Um, we did a magnetometer survey in the field, and as you can see, that showed up various anomalies. The very clearest anomalies are, are post-medieval field drains, ceramic field pipes and so on. But if you try to ignore that sort of later clutter, you can see various possible anomalies, which might be archaeologically interesting, um, crossing the field. So we were particularly interested in a possible, and if you look at the, the geo, particularly the geophysical plot at the top right-hand corner, you, you need to stand on one leg and squint, but you can almost see a rectangular building in that corner. That's very close to where the pig was, was discovered. And there's also a very um, faint linear mark heading across the field to the south of where that building is from the bottom right hand corner of the plot towards the corner of that building and i got i got a little bit excited as to whether that might be the line of this this roman road so we we had enough we thought to bother putting some trenches in to see whether there was anything going on there so in september 2020 we excavated some holes in the field over the air, the, the areas, those anomalies. Uh, here we are digging in the field. There's blue sky in this in this image, but it didn't half rain. Um, and it's very heavy clay soils. This happens in, in the field off Cobbler's Lane. And what happens then, of course, is the fields filled with water, the trenches filled with water. Um, so it became more of a paddling pool than an archaeological excavation. As it turned out, um, the anomalies, the, the anomalies that we were finding were likely more geological than archaeological, um, so we weren't able to, to cast any more light, sadly, on the potential archaeological context of the pig. I'm still holding out hope that there's some that there is a Roman road fairly close to this area. Um, obviously, it's very difficult without a time machine to know exactly what happened, how this pig fell off a wagon, if it would indeed was on a wagon and ended up in this field. Um, so we sort of still to some extent live in hope. Um, I'm just blue skying a little bit of thinking about the implications of what this pig means for the, the Roman archaeology in this area. I suppose it first of all it demonstrates that provincial administration were mining and processing minerals in this area much earlier than we previously thought. So as I say the previous lead mine, no, very well attested lead mining activities up on the coast, Hawking Mountain, possibly Dizeth and, and Prostatin. Uh, but it all seems to be from the time of Vespasian and later, whereas this is clearly happening in the 60s. It says something, although I'm not entirely certain what it says about the potential subjugation of the Dekiangvi tribe in the pre-Flavian period. We know that there were at least two armies across this area of, of northeast Wales, one in about 48, one in 60, when Suetonius Paulinus attacked the Druids on, in Anglesey and then had to scurry back to southeast England to sort out Boudicca. Um, so, but it's interesting that some of the, the, lead, the later Vespasian lead pigs have got the name of the Dekiangli actually mentioned in the pig, whereas ours is just the provincial governor. Um, something sh possibly shows that the, the administration were active well away from the heartland of the province. And I wonder whether it reflects the urgent need for both lead and silver to support and pay for the reconstruction efforts following the devastation that was wrought by the rebellion, because we, we, we know archaeologically there was significant damage to places like Camladunum and Londinium and, and the other burgeoning towns and cities of the southeast of England. And of course it helps, hopefully, and, th and this will be a hindsight one, uh, it helps to narrow down the line of the Roman road across this area, but we're still fervently hoping we're able to track it down as the weeks and months and years uh, go forth. Okay, so that um, also so the Rob's find um, of the lead pig also gave us the opportunity. We were um, looking at the wider landscape, I suppose, or the context of that, 
to have a look at this site that Steve had mentioned previously, just off Stringers Lane, um, where a number of artifacts have been found in the plough soil by metal detecting and also um, through Steve's exploratory wonders um, <laughs> through the field as well. Um, so having to having attempted to investigate sort of the, the footsteps of Trebellius Maximus, or at least the ingot that bears his name, and um, we also wanted to investigate this field, and we thought this prime example for us to sort of add that to the funding application. Um, so as part of the geophysics um, that was undertaken at Cobblers Lane in the autumn of 2020, we also did part of this field as well. Um, again, with, with Chris Matthews from Archaeological Survey West, um, again, using magnetometry and where the majority of uh, the building material had been found within the field, within the plough soil. So as Chris was actually processing the data on his laptop on site, um, I had a call from him, uh, quite an excited call from him, um, basically uh, detailing how this outline of, of a structure that I might want to look at has, has sort of almost jumped off the screen and slapped him in the face. And so I sort of went down to site and went to have a look at what he'd got. And I've honestly never seen such clear results. I don't think Steve has either, especially not in this part of Wales or Cheshire for that matter. Um, where it's almost like a geophysical black hole. Um, so just running off, um, off an east-west alignment um, and with a southerly aspect towards the Pulford Brook, um, we were able to identify the outline of a Roman villa. So in that area, we actually went back and did a, a higher resolution magnetometry survey um, to get an even clearer image, which is why um, this sort of bottom right-hand corner of the geophysics plot um, looks slightly crisper. Um, and here you can see a sort of a, a basic interpretation of those results with the main villa building itself, uh, a rectangular structure um, just in front, uh, some possible walling and high levels of burning um, towards the brook kind of to the southwest, um, also some field boundaries, possible outbuildings and, and other features as well. Now, obviously, geophysics, or with geophysics, you don't get a clear idea of the date of these things. Um, so it was then uncertain as to whether they were all chronologically contemporary or not. Um, and there was only really one way to find that out. But at a similar um, time, so uh, the geophysics was done, I think, just before the field was ploughed. Um, and then shortly after the ploughing of the field, we thought, let's get in and try and do some field walking. A couple of weeks after the geophysics, um, we did some targeting, targeted field walking over the main area of interest, um, picking up the artifacts from the surface. Uh, and I think in total, um, Steve and Chris recovered 25 kilos of ceramic building material, so mixtures of tile and, and um, brick. Uh, around 70 sherds of pottery, although a lot of it was quite abraded, uh, not really surprising if it's been in the plough soil. Um, some fragments of painted wall plaster, which you can see um, there on the right hand side, um, some opus signinum fragments. So these are uh, opus signinum is quite a uh, sort of iconic, um, quite a nice Roman flooring of crushed tile and lime mortar, which creates a sort of pinkish hue, um, all indicative of quite a high status building. And actually, no less than what one would expect to find in any villa, especially in sort of the south of England, for example. So that gave us enough really uh, ammunition, if you like, to apply for further funding um, to support a season of, of intrusive investigations or excavations um, to, to you and I. And so with kind permission from uh, the Willises who own and farm the land, uh, with generous support from Cadwin Cluid, Royal Communities Fund and the Roman Research Trust, and both um, the University of Chester and Wrexham Museum, we began excavations in September of this year. So we'd identified um, four initial areas that we wanted to target. Um, the villa itself, uh, as you can see outlined in trench three, so part of the villa itself, uh, the rectangular structure sitting just to the south of the villa, uh, trench two, the anomalies by the brook and possible outbuilding, uh, trench one, and also um, trench four, um, which or that out that um, outbuilding. So as we were opening up the trenches, though, um, we, we sort of had to reevaluate what might be feasible in a three-week um, excavation. It's amazing how small a trench looks when you're drawing it on a geophysics plot, but when you're there watching the digger actually strip the topsoil, um, it it suddenly uh, turns into something quite uh, quite a lot larger. 
So our, our plans for trench four had to be revised um, and that's a kind of a to be continued um, part of the project. Nonetheless, um, the main aims of what we wanted to do um, were to ground truth the geophysics, evaluate the condition and character of the buried archaeology, including the preservation and survival of artifacts and environmental evidence, and in doing so, um, that would then be able to inform um, strategies for further investigation and also the management of the site moving forward. So I just want to take you through um, what we found in Trench 3. So starting with the villa itself. Um, and on our first day machining off the topsoil, I think it was actually within about six minutes or so, um, we literally struck Roman masonry lying, it can't have been more than about 20 centimetres beneath the ground surface in places. So, I mean, that was rather unexpected, um, but at least it meant that we didn't have to remove all sorts of overburden, um, which was quite a relief, uh, especially when I looked at how big the trench was getting. Um, it's also perhaps where the walls showed up so clearly on the magnetometry because it's, it's so close to the surface, but also probably because of the lime mortar used in the bonding. Um, stone doesn't often show up um, in magnetometry quite like it might do, for example, in a resistivity survey. So the, yeah, it's proximity to the surface and the type of burnt material in, in the bonding is probably what um, lit it up like a Christmas tree, if you like, on the magnetometry. The walls themselves of the villa um, were quite obvious despite their varying levels of survival. So in places we had um, the lower courses of the masonry still surviving um, with two nicely sort of hewn faces uh, and a rubble core, exactly what you would expect from um, a Roman wall. In other places, it was just the ghost outlines like you can see in the right hand image there of where the wall had once stood and there were the remnants of some lime mortar left behind on top of clay bedding. But overall, we were able to get quite a good uh, layout of the villa itself, or this part of the villa, even where some of the walls had been completely robbed out to foundation level. Um, whether that was uh, in subsequent um, kind of activity or during or deliberately sort of removal of walls during the lifespan of the villa, the trench had more or less produced what we could see in the geophysics, um, which was really reassuring, and which is the plan of a winged corridor villa. So Romano-British winged corridor villas are fairly common, um, although certainly not in North Wales or Northwest England. Um, they're distinguished by their layout, as you can see in the images on the screen here. Um, so you've got a front corridor or walkway uh, with a range of rooms to the rear. Uh, the walkway can, is quite often porticoed or um, not sort of fully enclosed. Um, and then at each end of that walkway, you have two rooms creating wings or ally as they would have been known. So they often vary in size and the specific kind of layout of them. Um, so you can see the example here from Oxfordshire um, and one from Nottinghamshire, uh, but generally they're sort of these variations on quite a simple theme. Uh, lots of them, as I said, uh, exist in southern and central England um, and many develop into larger sort of more complex villas, some of them are quite palatial as well. Um, as yet, it's not entirely clear how much ours has altered over its lifetime, but that's a question that we hope to be able to answer moving forwards. Inside the villa, um, we have evidence for flooring, although not much of it survives. Where it does survive, um, it's been patched in places, um, but otherwise it's been quite heavily truncated through later episodes of disturbance, presumably by a combination of, of robbing uh, and of much later ploughing. But we do have evidence for internal room dividers. So the top right image, um, there's almost like a, a half wall um, creating some kind of internal um, space division. Uh, the top left image, um, there's some part excavated flooring uh, within the corridor itself or the walkway itself. We also have remnants of painted wall plaster. So the internal walls were decorated and painted. Uh, a range of pottery including some imported sort of decorated samian. Uh, we've got box flue tiles, like Steve mentioned earlier, um, that would be used in hypercourse sort of heating systems. The ceramics um, from Trench 3 range in date um, from the second century AD, although those sheds are highly abraded, um, to the fourth century. 
uh, where we've got Oxfordshire and Hammerhead Mortaria, so sort of pestle and, pestle and mortar type kind of mixing bowls. Um, we've also had five coins from Trench 3 as well, um, two of which are identifiable or clearly identifiable, and they both date from the fourth century as well. Uh, pretty much like this one. Uh, this is the first one that came up on site, I think on day one, uh, which was actually found uh, by Rob going through the backfill, um, sorry, the, the spoil. Uh, it's a copper alloyed numus of the House of Constantine. Um, the mint, I think, is unclear, but it dates from around 335 to 341. Um, and that's our latest, latest coin on site. So we've clearly still got activity um, on the site by sort of getting on to the mid fourth century AD. We were also able to start to see evidence for the reorganization in the layout of the villa um, with one of the internal walls, walls seemingly uh, being deliberately dismantled sometime after 306 to 307. Um, this wall here, which uh, had been demolished, yet in the fill, uh, it produced this rare uh, coin. Um, it's a coin of Constantine the I when he was Caesar, so really closely datable to around 306 to 37. And in fact, uh, it was minted in London. And I've recently discovered through the Twitter sphere, the wonders of social media, um, that it was likely minted in the latter months of AD 307. So maybe November 307. So that's what exactly what um, 1714 years ago, maybe um, to this month, who knows? Uh, but that gives us a fantastic sort of terminus post quem or earliest possible date for this wall having um, been demolished, for this act having occurred. So it's these kind of little snippets of archaeology um, that make, for me, make this site really exciting. But the final feature um, of the villa that I'd like to just sort of go through with you um, is located in the northeast corner. So identified um, after the topsoil strip by a rubble spread. Um, clean, we cleaned up around it, uh, peeled back the top there of rubble, um, and we're able to identify some regularity to the organisation of some of the stones. Uh, it appeared as though it might be a drain or some sort of lined kind of gully leading from the eastern wall of the villa um, out into the kind of the external space. The stones themselves had an internal face on them and actually on in further investigation, the lines of the face stone went through the building itself, um, through the wall, um, presumably um, beneath the flooring in the internal space but also had some quite substantial construction elements, especially on the southern side. And so we put some small sort of exploratory sondages, or had a fertile, I think is the technical term, um, through this, um, and we're able to kind of identify that this was a hypercourse system. So running from a stoke, uh, where on the right-hand image, Chris is, is standing there with the GPS, um, through into the villa, um, so through the wall into the villa itself, as I said, presumably underneath the flooring, um, with the draw for the hypercost leading eastwards away from the villa building itself, um, which you can see in the left hand image. So the stoke and the section of the flue excavated as well showed signs of burning, so it had apparently um, been fired, which was great. Just how far the heating system goes into the villa itself um, will be a question um, I'd like to answer in, in future uh, investigations. But the southern face of it, so just to the left of um, the image that's got Chris standing in it, um, it's quite substantial kind of blocks of masonry um, forming the foundation of a wall there. Um, so that would have kind of shielded the stoke on the right hand side where Chris is standing is the access to it in order to light it and maintain it. And the superstructure of that wall on the left on the south side appears, you can see in the section there, to have been pushed into the stoke and flue um, in an attempt to sort of decommission the hypercost. Um, so we've got samples of the burnt material sealed beneath that demolition rubble. Um, which hopefully we'll be able to get some radiocarbon dates from as well, so be able to get an idea of, of when this, this building was actually, or this part of the building was decommissioned. So we have a rather nice, albeit somewhat denuded, uh, Wings Corridor Villa, uh, which would have looked uh, something like the first phase of Villa at Lullingston, um, down in Kent, you can see in the reconstruction there. But 
We also have a range of other structures um, that we identified, which I shall hand over to Steve to tell you about. Thank you. So trench one, which is to the south west of the villa complex itself. So again, looking at the image of the geophysics on the top right of the screen. Thank you, Caroline. Um, there's that's the location of trench one. Um, when we initially saw the geophysics, we were wondering whether we had a sort of square courtyard of some kind to the south of the villa, possibly with a range of buildings uh, to the north, possibly certainly judging by the geophysics to the uh, on the western side. We don't know about the east and the south. Obviously, the stream is to the south of the of, of the postulated courtyard and the the area to the east of the villa is in another field, which we haven't done any geophysics of, though we would like to. Um, the detailed geophysics that we did when we started finding buildings on the magnetometer survey didn't span the the entire area where trench one was located. So that's why I think partially it's rather difficult to interpret what's going on, but clearly there are walls, there, were wall, there are walls down in that area. If you look at the, 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 the field working walking plot, which actually shows distribution of upper signinum fragments that we found during the field walking. Uh, one thing of interest is that there's clearly a, a fair amount, relatively a large amount of upper signinum coming from that range of buildings. Uh, over over and around trench trench one, um, but also it it shows an interpretation of the walls which the geophysic is showing, which almost like a sort of reverse F sort of alignment of of, of possibly masonry. And if you look at the the pre excavation plan after the topsoil strip below the vertical, you'll see again a sort of reverse F of stone walls appearing below the plough soil there. Other, the other interesting thing we were getting from trench one, very different to the main villa trench, is that we were getting signs of rubble. Um, and obviously the, the, up in the main villa trench, we seem to be going straight down onto the floors and on top of the walls, whereas in trench one, there seems to be a bit more preservation of the archaeology, so the high hopes that we'll be, see a bit more stratification where it's probably been ploughed away in, in, in large areas of the main site. Uh, that's partly because we're on a bit of a slope towards the stream, so there's a bit of hill wash, a bit of plough wash, and so on going down the down the brook. You can see the the the, the walls are not quite as close to the surface in this trench uh, as they are on the main villas trench. Hence, I think the survival is is somewhat better. Um, again, substantial stone walls appearing pretty early on during the course of the excavation. It's very much an exploratory trench, as you can see from this much smaller trench. Uh, than the one over, over on, on the villa site. Um, so obviously not high hopes of getting a great deal of evidence because it's just a very narrow trench. But clear, we're right in the middle of the trench, we're getting this, uh, this stone building. Um, this large stone wall which is about 90 centimetres wide, I think roughly, uh, on the bottom right-hand corner of the slide, extending down the slope towards the brook, which is off on the left-hand side of the slide. Uh, then returning where there's a bit of a hole you can see on the corner of the trench, returning across to the left hand side of the upper ranging rod, and then at the far end of the trench, just the, as, the, as the area drops down, returning again to the north. Um, you can see between the ranging rods and between the walls, these sort of whitish, milky sort of whitish areas. These are surviving areas of Opus Ignite and flooring, um, particularly on the right hand side of the slide. Uh, just to the right of that smaller wall crossing the, 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 the room. Um, the Opus Signine is, is virtually intact in places. Um, evidence of um, post-medieval robbing of, of masonry, uh, which are these large holes which have robbed out the corners of, of the building. Thanks, Caroline. Um, but also evidence of uh, modifications to the building. So therefore that the wall just above the lower ranging rod crossing the building from east to west, that wall there, uh, that's clearly been added later. It cuts the Opus Ignitum floor and it butts the, the external walls of, of the building. Next slide, please. So we've, we've had, before we started digging, we had high hopes that this might be a bathhouse complex. Um, presumably any self-respecting villa would have a bathhouse. Um, this particular building is quite close to Pulford Brook, so there's a source of water. 
and there was quite a lot of burning showing, particularly off the side of the trench on the right hand side of this particular slide, showing on the geophysics. So burning, heat, water were sort of suggestive of their, their possibly being a bathos here. Um, there's nothing so far which is hugely uh, um, warranting that interpretation. Uh, there's a rather nice uh, copper pin, which Caroline will have a slide of in a second, I think, uh, which was found near the building, which might be possibly something to do with bathing. I think we are pushing the envelope a little bit there, probably in terms of interpretation. Um, but we're still clinging on to the possibility that it might be a bathhouse. But clearly, uh, we need to see more of the building in, in, in order to interpret what the building was. Um, there is some evidence of the building having been extended or been added to. So on the right hand side of the screen, you can see there's a short wall extend butting up against the corner, almost to the corner of the building and then extending to the south towards the brook. And judging by the geophysics, I'm guessing this is going to return and join the sort of southeast corner of the structure in an area where it's been robbed away. Um, similarly, on the left hand side of the screen, um, next to again a, a robbed out area of the main building on one of the last days of the excavation we found another wall extending away to the sort of north west of the structure and I, I'm, I, I'm trying to make it a curved wall because I'm quite I would like quite like to see an upside extension a la cold plunge bath but clearly again we need to see more of the uh, structure to be able to make any, any sort of determination of what the structure what the building is being used for. Um, so nothing, nothing that shouts bathhouse yet. But as I say, we live in, we live in hope. Next slide, please. Just to try and make a, a little bit more sense of of that, a vertical view showing the various walls and the various floor. You can see the open signal and floor area in places. So we've got the southern end of a, of a stone building. It's a rather narrow stone building. It's around about four and a half meters wide, from what I can remember. Uh, this internal partition wall, which rather forms a, a corridor at the southern edge of the building, and then these various extensions being added to the building subsequently through its life. Um, but we obviously need to go back and extend the trench, both towards the brook and to the north towards the villa, to have more of an idea as to what the building was. But we still hope for a bathhouse, I think, fair to say. So trench two, Oh, sorry, the Prestatin bath. I just want to throw this in as, a, as a, uh, an example of a bathhouse from, a, from the area of Northeast Wales. I, I actually dug at uh, Melod Avenue in 1981 with Ken, Kenneth Brassel, uh, one of the early evaluations of the site, though we didn't actually work on the bathhouse, but, um, but it's a very interesting site with actually wooden posts still in their post holes, which is a, the one and only time I think I've ever excavated that kind of site. But as sort of, sort of the just to give an example of the sort of bathhouse structure we might be thinking about at Rosset, where this is upsidal cold plunge bath and the, uh, the sort of hot and tepid and hot rooms on the interior. And this particular bathhouse, although it was excavated in the 30s, I think, uh, seems to date to around about the time of the Emperor Hadun in 120, and it was enlarged in, in the middle of the uh, second century. So trench number two, finally, so here it is in the middle of our postulated courtyard, this rather strange squared structure uh, immediately to the south of the, of the villa's corridor. We, when we first saw this, we, there were all kinds of ideas floating around as to what it might be before we excavated the site. Uh, a nymphaeum was mentioned by, by somebody, I think a mausoleum was mentioned by somebody else, not mentioning any names, Chris. Um, so. Uh, we didn't really know what it was, but we, we had our doubts as to whether it was a Roman structure, largely because of the alignment of it. So we put a trench across it to have a look, see what it was. When we excavated it, we saw uh, effectively a rubble platform. Um, you can see the villa site off to the right, the people stood there pointing. That's where the villa is. And trench one we were just talking about is off to the left of the slide. Um, it's vaguely rectangular, slightly rectangular, roughly eight metres by nine metres, something like that. And there was some suggestion, even at this early stage, that there was a masonry wall surrounding it. So we, we, we dug it by quarters, we excavated uh, opposite corners of the site, as one would do a, a, a Bronze Age barrow or whatever. Um, and indeed, the, we did find that there was a reasonably founded wall 
on most sides of the of the building we call it it seemed to have been built largely of reused villa material so there was a fair proportion of roman tile and other masonry uh, we used within the construction uh, the outer face of the wall in places had, uh, had vanished particularly on the northwest side which is the far side of the image you can see there uh, there was some evidence of internal rendering on the inside face of the of the structure in places um, full of rubble um, again some roman roman material within the rubble but more interestingly there were three or four sherds of 13th or 14th century pottery that was found within the rubble itself and some possible medieval floor tiles although they weren't in situ as you can see the base of the hole uh, that, that it forms that it forms quite uneven that's the natural sand of gravels but really good evidence of of significant burning in fact, there was so much timber um, that we, we've sent some off for dendrochronology and C14 dating to see if we can get more evidence from the, from the structure. So whatever it is, a piece of burnt down and then backfilled with, with whatever rubble. Um, so the structure itself appears to be therefore medieval. I'd say it's roughly rectangular. It's aligned roughly, actually more or less exactly east-west. Um, Interestingly, the area of the field on the tithe maps is called Chapel Croft. Um, so the thought has occurred to us that it might perhaps we're looking at a medieval chapel site, but there's really no archaeological evidence so far to support that hypothesis. Uh, perhaps if we expanded the trench and found a number of um, burials in the area, that would significantly support that theory. But as it stands at the moment, it's a rather strange structure which is clearly not Roman although it's built out of Roman uh, reused Roman material um, but we'll see what the the dating evidence comes back from the burning material and then, and then make a decision then as to what it might be so if anybody in the audience have got any views as to what it what it is we'd be more than happy to uh, to hear them Yeah, so what, whatever, whatever is a mystery remains um, a complete mystery <laughs> uh, for the time being, I think. Um, so we're getting a picture, though, of a multi-period site, uh, potentially even with a number of Roman phases within that. Um, and as mentioned, the artefacts suggest activity from the late 1st or early 2nd century AD through to the 4th century, and then the reuse of the site in possibly uh, up to the 13th or 14th century as well. What happened between that time um, remains uncertain, but is certainly an area of interest. So the artifacts themselves from the site, um, though, suggest that materials survive well. So metal objects survive well, animal bones survives pretty well, uh, the plaster, as well as all the ceramic material. And the occupants of the villa were clearly connected to supply networks and integrated into the Roman economy, as one would expect, I suppose, of a villa site. Um, we've got regional ceramics and local ceramics, so Holt, um, Holt wares. We've got uh, black burnish ware from the south coast of England, Oxfordshire wares, um, as well as access to the kilns at Holt as well. Um, for the, we've got uh, on the last day, in fact, out of trench two being reused in the construction material for that later building, uh, we had a partial um, Legio 20 stamp from Holt. So that's our only direct military connection so far. Although the fact that they're sourcing their brick and tile from a local um, tile works is perhaps unsurprising. Um, there are artifacts as well that hint at the agricultural elements of the site. So quernstone fragments uh, for the grinding of grain, spindle whorls for the spinning of wool. However, um, not much in terms of quantity other than iron nails, lots and lots of iron nails. Um, also not much in terms of uh, items of personal adornment, which um, I was rather disappointed with. I do love me a nice Roman brooch. Um, and there's probably several reasons for this. Um, one being the sort of plough damage and disturbance, um, including uh, then the metal detecting of the plough soil over the last however many decades. But also we haven't found the rubbish dumps yet. We haven't actually excavated the middens um, for associated with the use of the villa. Um, and so therefore we need to sort of think about um, where we might find this material that will help us date activity at the site and get a bit more of a flavor um, for everyday life. 
But we did, however, get a fragment of copper alloy hairpin from trench one, as, as Steve mentioned, and is pictured um, here on the bottom left image. Um, and I love this uh, because it demonstrates the presence of women on site as well. Um, so hairpins are one of the only kind of Romano-British artefacts that we can categorically say uh, was a female sort of object. Um, so I like the way that sort of adds a bit more texture um, to our understanding of, of the villa and who lived there. Um, but otherwise, uh, another key aim of the project has been to try and involve as many people as possible in as many ways as logistically feasible. Um, and considering the importance of the site archaeologically, uh, we really wanted to ensure that we were communicating our findings as much as we could. Um, so we had a very popular open day, as you can see some images on the left hand side there with um, one of, I think it was Steve's tours. Uh, it was very well subscribed. Um, we had schools out on site with us, um, so we did two schools residencies with Darland High School um, and St Peter's Rosset. Um, and of course, the social media presence we tried um, to keep active as well uh, with video dig diaries, the fifth one of which um, I think was released last week with a bit of a, a summary um, of what we'd found. Um, but not only that, um, we had, of course, local and student volunteers. Uh, without whom none of this would have been possible. Um, we had a fantastic, enthusiastic team um, with us over the three weeks, um, and we'd like to express our thanks to each and every one of them. And of course, I've got the pictures of them here smiling and having a wonderful time in beautiful sunshine. Um, and we can't you know, be digging in Britain without mentioning the weather. Um, some of them uh, adhere, or managed to deal with 31 degree heat um, so very, very different uh, conditions to digging at Cobblers Lane, that's for sure. But to summarise, um, began with Rob Jones finding an extraordinary object uh, bearing the name of Marcus Trebellius Maximus. Um, he triggered questions about our understanding of the conquest phases of North East Wales, as well as pre-flavoring pre-Flavian extraction and processing of lead and silver by the Roman state. It's challenged our understanding of the road network in Roman Northeast Wales um, and has led to the discovery of another extraordinary thing, which is a Villa Rustica in an area previously thought to have been dominated by military and industrial, and it was assumed rural roundhouse settlement. So by following in the footsteps um, of Trevelyan's Magnus, uh, and embarking on a larger scheme of survey and investigation over the next few years, we hope to be able to identify more evidence for Roman activity in a landscape that would have been rich pickings, whether you were a farmer, uh, made a living from the local mineral resources, or perhaps were a retired soldier settling down within close proximity of the fortress. So thank you all uh, very much for listening to us. Um, this was one of the last days of filling. Um, with the rainbow, which we hope was a good omen, <laughs> is a good omen for the future seasons um, and the future projects ahead of us. Um, thanks, of course, to everybody um, who was involved in the project and especially um, to Cuddling Fluid and the Roman Research Trust. Um, and I'm just going to let Steve plug this again. <laughs> Again, so <laughs> glad to see that the site is going to visit the exhibition before it finishes. Um, it finishes at the end of January, January 29th, I think it is. It's an exhibition that we've created with the assistance of the National Museum of Wales, who actually own the material that was found in Holt uh, through Acton's excavations around about the time of the First World War, together with the Holt History Society, who have also put the, to the exhibition together with us. Uh, particularly exciting, hopefully, is the return of the lead pig we've been talking about, which is uh, literally travelling back from London on Monday, and we'll be going into uh, into the exhibition sometime next week. I, I, I don't know exactly when, uh, and, and I dare say it will fall to me to lift the damn thing into the case again. Um, and also some of the, the objects that we've found, which Carol has shown some of the slides off, are also going on display. And to, in, to add to in further excitement, the, the short documentary film that Caroline and I spent several hours filming yesterday on site uh, will also be shown in the gallery as well. So there's many more reasons to visit the exhibition again if you haven't already if you haven't already seen it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Back to you, Rachel.